Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. So last week when I had the pleasure of, of speaking here, um, I began a, a teaching that's really a classical Buddhist teaching on what are called the three characteristics or the nature or the laws of life, of impermanence and unsatisfactoriness and, and emptiness, which sounds kind of dreary when I say it actually, <laughs> but you'll see. But anyway, I only got part way through that talk. There was all these stories I wanted to tell and then I said, well, we'll, we'll do it in two weeks. So tonight in a certain way is a continuation of that talk, it is. Um, and what I had called it uh, last week was freedom and the way that it is. Um, and in part I wanted to speak of this because you can so clearly feel the turning of the seasons and how it's getting dark again earlier than it was and the crickets are singing to you and telling you that it's autumn coming and school has started and all these changes of cycles and this is also Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur and the end of Ramadan and um, a whole set of um, observances really of these changing of cycles. Um, but I wanted to speak about the changing seasons and the changing seasons of, of our life um, from the sense of freedom in the midst of these changes. And I'm going to read a story that I started with last week just sort of to catch up. Mostly I won't be repeating, but um, uh, this is a Zen story of a man who went to a great Zen master and got these teachings of koans, of paying attention to the nature of reality, and then had to move away. Um, and so the master said, well, then you must write to me every week or every month or every season as it fits you and let me know about your spiritual progress. So the disciple being somewhat faithful um, in the first mo month wrote he had practicing meditation deeply I feel an expansion of consciousness and experience my oneness with the universe. The master glanced at the note and threw it away. <laughs> the following month this is what the letter had to say I finally discovered the holiness that is present in all things. The master seemed a bit disappointed. In his third letter, the disciple enthusiastically explained, ah, the mystery of the one and the many has been revealed to my wondering gaze. The master yawned. His next letter said, no one is born, no one dies, no one lives for the self is not. The master threw up his hands in despair. After that, a month passed, then two, then five, then a whole year. And the master thought it time to remind his disciple of his duty or commitment to keep him informed of his spiritual progress. The disciple wrote back and said, who cares what you think? <laughs> the master read those words and a look of satisfaction spread across his face. He said, thank God he's gotten it at last. <laughs> So one of the most important things to understand about undertaking a meditation practice or a spiritual path of this kind is that it's not fundamentally about, about self-improvement. You know, and self-improvement has its place. I mean, there are a lot of people in Marin that would go out of business without your self-improvement, <laughs> right? The gyms, the trainers, the therapists, the Botox, whatever it happens to be. I don't know what, you know, what you go in for. Um, but that's not really the game. That's not really the fundamental point. Um, the point is to discover a freedom in the midst of the particular body and personality and mind and family. Oh my God, family, you know, <laughs> body. Oh dear, ba body, a uh, culture, civilization in, you know, air parentheses to use Gandhi's word, it would be a good idea, Western civilization. Um, basically in human incarnation that you found yourself born into, um, 
what does it mean to find freedom not through rearranging and, and self-improvement, um, but actually in a much deeper sense, in the movements of all of life. So another story, a famous Zen story, of a nun who was very devoted in her meditation and she did years of training and struggled to get enlightened and of course in some ways the struggle is both perhaps necessary at first but in the end it, it becomes the, the difficulty. It's when you let go, when you stop struggling that then things are the way they are. But she was struggling as good Zen students do to try to get enlightened um, and all kinds of Buddhist students and then um, she got so tired of this struggle and she went to the master and she said, I know I have to do something different. I want permission to go and live in that hut on the top of the mountain and just let everything, you know, settle some way, understand in a new way and either get enlightened or die. The master said, fine, go up there, you know, <laughs> take your best shot or whatever it was, you know. <laughs> so she took her, her little bits of possessions and started up this long trail in the mountains in China to go to the top. And as she was coming up the path, down the path came this old man with a huge bundle on his back who was actually the Bodhisattva Manjusri, the Buddha who appears to people when they're ready to become enlightened or awakened in certain stories, um, carrying this great big bundle. And he said, say, um, oh, nun, good to see you. Uh, where, are you <laughs> where are you headed? And she told the story. I've been meditating for all these years and nothing, you know, no liberation. And I'm going to go on the top of the mountain and get enlightened or die or whatever. <laughs> and he listened quite sympathetically. And because he looked wise, she said, tell me, old man, do you know anything of this enlightenment? And he looked her in the eye. And he just let go of the bundle, this huge bundle he was carrying, and it dropped to the ground. <sighs> and she was free. She said, oh, wow, Let's just let things go. <laughs> Not try and pick anything up. So she was ecstatic, free. Ah, oh, this is it. And she looked at him for a moment, stood there, and then she smiled and she said, so now what? <laughs> at which point he reached, reached back down and picked up the bundle. <laughs> and continued down the path toward town. <laughs> and this is actually the movement of freedom. Um, I want it all. I want the losing of it all when it rains and the returning transparence, writes Jane Hirschfield. And it's the movements of breath. We breathe in and breathe, breathe out and we let things go and then we pick them up again. It's the it's the cycle of change within which we live what we are. And so the question from the Buddha was not about beliefs, that you're supposed to believe something, but what brings us happiness? What brings us freedom? And he said, O nobly born, remember your true nature, your Buddha nature. Remember the liberation that you were born with, the freedom that is fundamental to your being. So you meditate, mostly just to quiet the mind a little bit and open the heart so that you can listen and discover that there is a way to live in this mysterious incarnation with graciousness, with dignity, with a kind of spacious wisdom and a caring heart. And the way to live isn't to run from it to some monastery or cave. Having lived in monasteries, I can tell you that they're like living in a big family and you have the person in the hut next to you, you know, and the people who wash, you know, the dishes in the sink there. And, you know, as the old saying goes, wherever you go, there you are. There you are in the monastery and it's not really different. It's just you're there. <laughs> Wendell Berry, who writes, the cloud is free only to go with the wind. The rain is free only in its falling. The water is free only in its gathering together in its downward course and rising again into the air. In law, and he capitalizes it, law like dharma or truth or the way things are, in law is rest. If you love the law, if you enter singing into it as water in its descent. 
And so again, this is really a question of how do we find freedom in this mysterious incarnation? Um, and the paradox of it, because in some way we have to recognize the, the sacredness of it and the universal dimension that is our own true nature, the luminosity that shines betwe- behind everybody's eyes, even when they forget. Um, and the fact that um, we're just tentatively incarnated into a physical body and personality. It's not who you are. You rent it for a while. You get it. But it doesn't limit you in some way. So there's some vast universal truth. But also there's the particulars of your life. So as, as we say, you need to remember both your Buddha nature and your social security number. And that the two sides really have to be integrated to live wisely. Or another way Oscar Wilde's phrase is to live with the tainted glory of humanity. Because the question is not the future of humanity, but the presence of eternity. The sense that within our human incarnation, there's a connection to that which is timeless and sacred, that we all know is true because it's who we are and where we came from. Now the first law going through these characteristics or laws that I spoke of last week is that things aren't fixed. They're not static. Instead we are going downstream, have you noticed? You know, and that includes aging and sickness and death. Um, Remember when you first saw a a corpse? You were the Buddha in that moment seeing his first dead body and saying, wait a second, what happens here? Hmm, I think I better take notice to this because it's almost impossible to imagine it exactly until all of a sudden you're in the presence of someone who's died. It's shocking. And, and, and then it's as if the gateway between the worlds, the curtain between the worlds open and you say, oh, it's not just as solid and unchanging as I thought, is it? And like it or not, going downstream, the body changes, you know, circumstance change. Zen Master Suzuki Roshi's description of Buddhist teachings in three words, not always so. Things can't be repeated. And it's like we are going down the stream and sometimes we get caught in a, like a whirlpool or maybe we are this little whirlpool for a while and think that we're separate from the rest of the river. And we are sort of for a time and need to honor that and recognize and see, wave to the other whirlpools, you know. But it's, It's also the same water of the river. So praise and blame, gain and loss, pleasure and pain, fame and disrepute. These are the Buddha's eight worldly winds. They change all the time. Anybody not have that experience? Raise your hand. (laughs) Pleasure, pain, praise and blame, gain and loss. In the Mahabharata, there's some point, I believe, where maybe it's Krishna talking with Arjuna about the wonders, the miraculous things of this world. And, you know, in all the marvels of the world, Arjuna asked Krishna, what's the most amazing thing in this world? And uh, Krishna asked Krishna, I think it's Krishna says, the most amazing thing is to observe that people can see others die all around them and think that it won't happen to them. But that's really a miraculous thing. That we see this truth and still think, well, moi, as Miss Piggy would say, it's just not, you know, it's not going to happen to me. And so Buddhist practice is basically getting in line with reality. You can fight with reality, but you know who's going to win in the end, right? This from my dear friend Ajahn Sumedho, who is a amazing um, monk and, and elder American monk. He writes, for minds obsessed by compulsive thinking, grasping, acting, you simplify your meditation practice to just two words, let go, rather than to try and develop this practice and develop that and achieve this and go into that. 
The grasping mind wants to read the Buddhist texts and study the Abhidharma and learn Sanskrit and Pali and Madhyamaka and Prajnaparamita and get ordinations in Hinayana and Mahayana and Vajrayana and write books and become a renowned authority on Buddhism. But instead of becoming the world's expert on Buddhism and being invited to great international conferences, why not just let go? <laughs> For years, I did nothing but this in my practice because I held on so tightly. Every time I tried to figure it out and become something and do something, I'd say, let go, let go, until all that striving would fade away. So I'm making it very simple for you to save you from getting caught in an incredible amount of suffering. There's nothing more sorrowful than having to attend international Buddhist conferences. <laughs> Some of you might have the desire to become the Buddha of the age, Maitreya, radiating love throughout the world. Instead, just be an earthworm who knows only two words. Let go. Let go. You see, ours is called the lesser vehicle, so we only have these poverty-stricken practices. So there's a paradox, though. There's really something that a that's asked more of you in wisdom. Um, about letting go because it can be misunderstood. And that is that it's not passivity. It's not simply acceptance. And I think something in you knows this, that just acceptance and being kind of a passive blob um, is not enough. You are going downstream and it's true. You can paddle upstream for a few minutes, but it ain't, you aren't gonna get very far. It's just not how it works. But you can paddle graciously downstream. You can avoid bumping into things, you know. You can paddle over to people who are having difficulty. There are things that you can do when you go with the rain that falls, when you understand the way things are. And you can make the world more just. You can be gracious and you can be honorable. To do so requires that you learn, as Manjushri was teaching, both when to let go and when to pick things up. This is a story I used to read years ago and just pulled out for tonight. This is from a letter to an insurance company. In response to your request for additional information in block number three of the accident reporting form, I put poor planning as the cause of my accident. <laughs> you asked for a further explanation. I am a bricklayer by trade and on the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of the new six-story building. When I completed my work, I had 500 pounds of brick left over. Rather than carry them down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel using a pulley attached to the side of the building. Securing at the rope at ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, and loaded the brick into it. Then I went back to the ground and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the 500 pounds of bricks. <laughs> you will note in block number 11 of the accident reporting form that I weigh 135 pounds. <laughs> Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rather rapid rate up the side of the building, where in the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming down. This explains the broken collarbone and fractured skull. Slowed slightly, I continued my rapid ascent until the fingers of my right knuckle were deep in the pulley. Fortunately, by this time, I regained some presence of mind and was able to realize that this was not the time to let go of the rope. <laughs> Unfortunately, however, at the same time, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Devoid of the weight of bricks, the barrel now weighed approximately 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight in block number 13. <laughs> Uh, yes, this accounts for the two fractured ankles and lacerations and so forth. Anyway, um, you get the point. That we breathe and that everything breathes and everything turns in cycles. The, the phases of the moon and the menstrual cycles and the stock market, as I said last week, and the galaxies are turning. And... Um, the point is not passively accepting, but rather relaxing. And then responding to what's necessary. And I think of my teacher Ajahn Chah, 
who was a very wonderful, gracious being, had tremendous kind of ease and graciousness about him, really wise. Um, and a lot of times he just knew how to let go. I remember when we were um, going on this ride up in the mountains to a temple on the border of Cambodia, and we had this terrible driver who was driving at high speeds, uh, you know, on these dirt roads in the mountains, and once in a while a huge logging truck or bus would come by and he'd swerve out of the way. I felt sure we were going to die. It was really scary. You know, and then I noticed my teacher's knuckles were white and holding on, and I I was somehow reassured by that. I don't know, you know. (laughs) And finally we got there, survived this ride. We asked him to slow down, but he wouldn't. And um, he turned to me and he said, scary ride, wasn't it? You know, like, like he'd just been in Disneyland, you know. And it wasn't, that, it wasn't a scary ride. It was. It's just the way it was. I don't think he was afraid to die. He was just saying that was a scary ride. This is the way things are, you know. And there was a, there was a, a nun, an American or European nun, who was one of the first and charismatic uh, disciples of, of the women in Ajahn Chah's monastery, And she, after five years of being a nun and having, attracting attention of a lot of the villagers and people there, because she was devoted and charismatic, she disrobed, she left pretty suddenly. And the next thing they heard that she had joined a fundamentalist Christian um, group and had been converted and had a born again experience. And about six months later, she showed up again And she was very adamant in this little forest monastery about trying to convert everybody now with her charism to the Christian way. And it was a little tough for her old friends. You know how the conversion thing goes, I'm sure you (laughs) know. But more than that, it was really upsetting to all these villagers who'd fed her and supported her and loved her. And now she was back saying, in their mind anyway, you know, an entirely different message. And they got really upset after a while and so they kind of marched over through down this road and through the forest the eight miles to the main monastery where Ajahn Chah was a whole party of them and said we built this monastery for for these westerners and they've come to practice Buddhism but look you know she turned into a Christian she's trying to convert us all in this fundamentalist way and you know what do we do about this and they were all up in arms and Ajahn Chah listened for a while let them finish and he smiled and then he said Maybe she's right. (laughs) And it was such a beautiful moment because it sort of undercut all the attachments about the way it's supposed to be. And he just laughed and they went back, you know, and it was fine. Because the things that you make war with actually take you over. And he used to say all the time that in a certain way to meditate is to stop the war with the way things are, with what's too young or too old or right or wrong or hot or cold or, you know, whatever it happens to be, to step out of the battle and not be in conflict. So this is the letting go part. This is Manjusri releasing the bag. And you can feel how gracious it is and how gracious it would be in your family or your community or at work to just say, well, maybe they're right and not hold on so much. And yet, here's the paradox. You would enter the monastery and the the paths in the forest were swept beautifully clean every day, you know? And the decorum of the monks was beautiful, the way they folded their, the way we folded our robes and the dignity that people carried themselves, and there was a tremendous attention to integrity and virtue. You could lose, you know, gold in the monastery. Someone would just pick it up and put it on the altar. Who lost this? No one would take it from you. It felt like a place that was, had so much integrity and trust and safety in it because people were really virtuous and it was beautiful. And there was a a stillness to it, a kind of steadiness and concentration because there was a, a discipline that he taught. And there was a deep compassion as well. Everybody who came from the littlest ant, you'd, you know, you'd learn to step over the ant trails in the forest so you didn't harm any living being and you could feel it in the environment. So there was a deep compassion and a sense of freedom. And here is that paradox that he knew how to let go and at the same time he devoted himself 
to what he thought was beautiful, but not in a heavy-handed way. Can you understand that? Instead, it is the action or the work of the bodhisattva. And maybe later this fall I'll talk, do a series of talks on the bodhisattva, which is the, the beautiful image of a being who sets the compass of their heart on compassion no matter what. Even if the sun should arise in the west and the world turn upside down, the bodhisattva has only one way, which is the way of meeting this changing world with compassion, may all beings be safe, may all beings awaken, may all beings be tended to with a beautiful heart. And this is again, I love this passage from Thomas Burton where he writes to uh, a young activist, do not depend on the hope of results. You may have to face the fact that your work will be apparently worthless and achieve no result at all, if not perhaps bring about its opposite. And as you get used to this idea, you start more and more to concentrate not on the results, but on the value, the rightness, and the truth of the work itself. And so here's Ajahn Chah both able to let go and at the same time to devote himself to something that he knew was beautiful and worthy, but to do it in this gracious way. Can you feel this? And you can do the same thing. It's not Ajahn Chah. I mean, yeah, that was his way of being, but it is there in you. And it's really important because we're perhaps at the end of empire, if you take an honest look. Um, Such a time of change. And so we can look to exemplars when things were really difficult, to Aung San Suu Kyi and Martin Luther King and, you know, Cesar Chavez. I met Cesar Chavez's grandson, one of them, who's carrying on the work. And what he's doing, Anthony Chavez, he's going to middle schools, reminding children all around the state and all around the Western U.S. about his grandfather, because he's, his message is being forgotten. But it's, of course, a perennial message that needs to be renewed, and we're the carriers of it in our way. So we looked who carried it so beautifully, Aung San Suu Kyi, the the lamp of liberation in Burma, now 17 years of house arrest. How can we carry that? And the invitation to our spirit is to find both a strength or dedication, if you will, a steadiness, as Ajahn Chah had, and a graciousness and ease they're not separate from one another. As Thich Nhat Hanh said, when the crowded Vietnamese refugee boats met with storms or pirates, if everyone panicked, all would be lost. But if even one person on the boat remained calm and centered, it was enough. It showed the way for everyone to survive. And so this is both the steadiness and the graciousness that's asked. And you get challenged, and you get, you, you get thrown off balance, and then you start again. Um, I have a good friend, George Mumford, um, who was the meditation coach for the Chicago Bulls and the L.A. Lakers. He worked with Phil Jackson. You didn't know they had a meditation coach, did you? But they did. Um, and Phil Jackson is sort of the zen-oriented, one of the winniest, winningest coaches in, you know, in basketball history. Um, wanted his players, his young players, to understand the arts of mindfulness and concentration and steadiness and so forth, which George would teach them. Except, as maybe I said in last week or in one of these other talks, he didn't um, particularly have any need to train Michael Jordan. (laughs) Because Michael Jordan, he said, had more innate capacity for presence and concentration than anyone he'd met. Here's Michael Jordan. He says, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. And 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. How's that? You know, (laughs) talk about pressure. The shot that's going to make the game. And I lost 26 times and I missed. I failed over and over again in my life. But I still keep going out on the court with the same care and dedication, and that's why I succeed. And so you can hear the graciousness and the dedication, and somehow that they they come together. Now, 
because everything is changing, in its nature it is fundamentally unsatisfactory. Because, again, to use the because word, you have the most beautiful, wonderful thing, um, and then it changes. Or you have the romantic period of your relationship, remember that? (laughs) Or maybe you're in it, good, I'm happy, may it last, (laughs) you know? Or you have the most incredible dessert, but it's like, you know, whether it's chocolate or what Ajahn Chah would say, oh, you love chocolate, he'd look, he'd say, great, let's have chocolate three meals a day as your mainstay. (laughs) How long will that last? Because it's our nature, isn't it, that we actually need change. The world changes and we need it. But because it changes, uh, it's also insecure unsatisfactory. We want it to stay in some way and it doesn't and this is called dukkha. This is called the innate limitation of incarnation because things are changing and you don't get to hold on to them. Um, Not always so. And so dukkha is experienced personally when we lose things. Loss, grief, illness, Things that we want, we're separated from. Things that we don't want, we have to be with. Um, But again, more so at the end of empire, um, there is more war, you know, continued um, ignorance, whatever arrogance we have, you know, the celebration of excess and greed, you know it's true. The pornography of violence, continuing racism, Islamophobia is our now, our current enemy du jour. I talked about last week, I, I went to L.A. for a meeting this weekend and wore my kafia through the airport just to see how it would go. <laughs> you know, and I was a very friendly person, smiling, I mean, the Buddhist terrorist or whatever they were thinking, you know. But at the supermarket this week, I got the Globe. It's like the Inquirer, only maybe a couple of steps down. And it says, shocking proof, Obama is a Muslim. And he's wearing this, you know, white thing on his head that they photoshopped on. But he's also dressed kind of like Santa Claus. They kind of got their, you know, religious metaphors mixed up a little bit in this. But um, we laugh, and yet it's exquisitely painful also. It's profoundly painful. It was painful for the Irish and for the Italians and for the Japanese who were thrown into internment camps and for the, you know, m- the, the Africans who survived the Middle Passage and then came to slavery, f- for the Jews, for the, you know, for the Mexicans who, who in m- many cases, this was their land. Um, it's horribly painful. Um, and we are in the midst of it. Uh, this is called dukkha. And I, I read this over and over again from James Baldwin because it has such a dharmic truth to it. I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hate and prejudice so stubbornly is they sense that once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with their own pain. And so we project it on others We blame others in some way because we can't bear it, bear the insecurity of life, bear our own fears. And what Ajahn Chah taught, what the Buddha taught, what any wise spiritual path teaches is not to turn away. When I came to the gates of his monastery to enter as a monk, and I'd been visiting him and getting teachings when I came, you know, seriously as the monk, he said, I hope you're not afraid to suffer. I thought, that's a funny greeting, you know. (laughs) And then he he amplified it. He said, there are two kinds of suffering. The kind you run away from, which follows you everywhere, and the kind that you're willing to turn and face. And that is the place that will bring you freedom. And that's what we're interested here. So part of our task is to bring a consciousness to bear witness to the ignorance or the arrogance, or the measure of pain, or the great fear that's, you know, we're spreading terror. If there's any terrorism, it's the terror that's being promulgated, you know, in the psyches of so many people. To bear witness to, to tend, and to see that it's not the fundamental truth. 
to see the astonishing beauty of the world in all its variety and beneath and in every being you meet. So this from Clarissa Estes, Women Who Run With the Wolves. She writes, in fairy tales and myths, deities and other great spirits test the hearts of humans by showing up in various forms that disguise their divinity. They show up in robes and rags, silver sh sashes and with muddy feet. They show up in scales made of rose petal, as a lime yellow old woman, as a man who cannot speak or an animal who can. And the great powers are testing to see if humans have yet learned to recognize the sacred spirit in all its various forms. And so our task somehow is to see this sacredness and beauty in the midst of the suffering and not to turn our gaze away. And I'll talk a little bit more about it, but I think about this friend who works with uh, gang kids at Homeboy Industries in, uh, in Los Angeles. And one of the things that is his practice is to see these guys who are posturing and tattooed and, you know, basically they're survivors. They're, they're trying to survive, a, in some cases, a pretty hellish situation, you know, and come on. And he, his work is to look them in the eye and see that which is beautiful in them, which maybe no one ever gave voice to before and say it out loud. And it's an astonishing thing. I think Nelson Mandela said, it never hurts to see the good in another being. They often act the better because of it. To see that nobility. So things are impermanent. They're changing. You can't hold on. They're unsatisfactory and insecure. Ajahn Chah used to use the word my na in Thai, which means it's uncertain, isn't it? What's going to happen tomorrow? My na. Tell me about the spiritual path. My na, you know. What's, um, what's love? My na. Interesting, isn't it? Who are you? How did you get born in this mysterious body? My na. And that wisdom of insecurity, it's called, where you say, well, I don't know, and yet you relax in the stream, in the river, and say, this is the, the stream that carries life, and you are supposed to be here, and you are a part of it. It is you, and your freedom is to say, all right, let's have the ride. So impermanence, insecurity, unsatisfactoriness, and suffering, anybody not have, and emptiness, selflessness. Thus shall ye think of this fleeting world, a star at dawn, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, a rainbow, an echo, a phantom, a dream. And the more you pay attention, the less solid it seems. You sit th half an hour in meditation. You say to your mind, don't think. Does it listen? It has a mind of its own, right? The thoughts just secrete themselves. And they, you know, it's like that billboard and the cartoon in the New Yorker I like to talk about. Your car crossing the desert in Utah and, you know, the sign, roadside billboard that says, your own tedious thoughts next 200 miles, right? <laughs> it just does it. The breath breathes itself. The perceptions, you know, the, the, the breath breathes itself. The perceptions change one moment and another. This from Wendell Berry, he writes, little breath, breathe me gently, row me gently, for I am a river I am learning to cross. And so you feel your breath and you come into contact with the inner river. And the river of thoughts and feelings and perceptions and the sense of being solid, if you really listen, isn't so. There is no solid self, it's always changing. I saw this cartoon that showed, it was a doctor's office and there was um, the doctor and the patient and a big x-ray that was on the screen that you could see that the doctor was pointing to. And the patient for the doctor happened to be Elmo from Sesame Street. And on the x-ray screen, you could see the figure of Elmo and then this hand inside, right? <laughs> and the, doctor's, the doctor was saying, I don't know how to break this to you, but... <laughs> Uh, 
You're not exactly who you think you are. (laughs) Every breath we inhale billions of atoms that end up as heart cells, kidney cells, brain cells. The body gives birth to 100 billion red cells every day. Every square inch of the body is populated by 32 million bacteria that are born and die there over a few days. 50,000 of the cells in your body will die and be replaced with new cells all while you listen to this sentence. (laughs) You are living in a mystery. You are. You're also a feedlot, as Wes likes to say, (laughs) for all these other, other amazing beings. Life is not a journey to the grave to be arrived at in a beautiful and well-preserved body, but rather to slide in broadside, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. (laughs) So you start to see as you get quiet that you're not separate from this river, that you're part of the flow of this river, that you're interdependent with this river, that your breath is the same breath as the Amazon rainforest and as the person who's sitting next to you and as the bay trees and the laurels and the oaks that surround us. You know, and that your life and the life of the crickets and the bees and the ants of this land are completely intertwined. And when you see this, you start to become not so much caught in it, you become what Ajahn Chah said, don't get lost in the movie, become the one who knows. The space of awareness is the witnessing of this experience, but it's not the witnessing of detachment that doesn't care, Rather, it's the witnessing where you can quiet yourself and say, what a mystery and what a gift to be born into this. Let me use this well. Let me use this beautifully so that you're not caught in reaction, but that you can actually respond and give yourself. Mindfulness, mindfulness is the space of awareness, the ground of being, the invitation to the timeless consciousness that's always here. We are surrounded by vast silence, always, as vast as the galaxies. And in the silence, there are words and perceptions. To become aware, to sit in meditation, is an invitation to rest in the silence and to see from the one who knows, to see from the heart of the Buddha without judging or grasping. This is the way that it is with its horrors, its ocean of tears, you know, its injustice, and with its almost unbearable beauty. And then you know how to respond. Because as you sit in this way, Suzuki Roshi put it this way. He said, when we realize the fact that everything changes and find our composure in it, we find ourselves in nirvana. Nirvana means not resisting the way things are. When we realize the fact that everything changes and find our composure in it, this is liberation, this is freedom. And so as you practice, as you meditate, again, not to have any experience, because you'll have quiet meditations and noisy ones and delicious ones and raucous ones and ones that are filled with self-pity and ones that are filled with anger and fear, and ones that are filled with glorious things, because you're human. And that's just what's on the movie screen. But it's somehow to learn to trust, to rest with a graciousness and say, oh yeah, this is humanity, and what do I choose? How do I respond? My friend Rachel Naomi Remen writes about having dinner with her mother at one point. Her mother was in her 80s, and Rachel cooked up this beautiful dinner, chicken and potatoes and things. And her mother sat for the longest time and didn't eat. And, 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 and uh, Rachel said, mother, mom, what's, what's the problem? Is there something wrong? And she said, no, I'm just contemplating my chicken. And Rachel said, contemplating your chicken? <laughs> and she said, yeah, you know, I was looking at this chicken and I realized over my life, because I've you know, and I think about it, I've probably eaten 5,000 chickens, and I was wondering, was I worth it? 
I mean, she was really feeling somehow the life that had sustained her life. And she was reflecting, was I worth it? Was I worthy? I think her phrase was, was I worthy of my chickens? How's that? And so to stop in this mystery is to discover that you have a freedom. And the freedom is not some other place, but it's in your very body at the very age that you are and with the culture and conditioning that you have. Freedom does not need special conditions. The conditions are good enough to be free. In fact, conditions are perfect. To take your seat in this human form halfway between heaven and earth and open your eyes and your heart as a Buddha and see, yes, this is humanity and then to make something beautiful of it. And what you discover as you pay attention is that hidden in each of these laws or qualities of impermanence and unsatisfactoriness and emptiness is a treasure. There's an old Arabian night story about a poor farmer who was plowing this hard soil and his plow caught in the dirt and, and broke and he got really upset. And when he looked to see what it was, sitting there and weeping he saw there was this big stone he tried to get out of the field but he couldn't dislodge it and then he saw that there was an iron ring on it and finally he got something and dislodged it and it was a doorway into this vast treasure house where you stumble is your treasure it said sometimes not your ideals about how it's supposed to be your life or anybody's life but actually here and now how it is. This is the place of freedom. Can you be free here? The freedom that Nelson Mandela had walking out of 27 years of Robben Island prison. Not some other place. So a man began to give large doses of cod liver oil to his Doberman because he'd been told that the stuff was good for dogs. Each day he would hold the head of the dog protesting dog between his knees, force its jaws open and pour the liquid down its throat. One day, the dog broke loose and spilled the oil on the floor. Then to the man's surprise, his great surprise, it returned to lick the spoon. That's when he discovered that what the dog had been fighting was not the cod liver oil, but his method of administration. <laughs> Can you be gracious in allowing impermanence, in allowing things to be the way they are, you begin to sense endless creativity that each new day in this mystery, something new will happen, completely unexpected. And I remember my friend Michelle, who was a preschool teacher for a while, she took her four-year-olds and five-year-olds out to the woods one day to study death. Because little kids are interested in death. They want to learn about it. You know, they're, they're checking, you know, what is this incarnation about? And she said, all right, let's go out in the woods and bring back all the dead stuff you can find. <laughs> and so they got really busy. Sticks and leaves and, you know, a little bone from something. And they started mounding up dead stuff. There was, you know, there's a lot of it in the woods, if you haven't noticed, right? And once they'd make, done that for a while, she had them sit down and she said, so... What did you find? They said, there's dead stuff everywhere. And she said, so does that, what does that mean? Do you, do you think de death is a bad thing? And they said, oh, no, no, it looks like, like the forest needs it. We need it. She said, well, why do we need it? She said, because otherwise the, there'd be more and more and more trees and there'd be no room for us. And it's the fact that things can recycle that makes place for something new. The fact of impermanence that allows at whatever age and whatever place you are for that beautiful spirit in you to have a new day tomorrow and do something remarkable. And it is never too late to start again. In beginner's mind, the goal of meditation is to keep beginner's mind in the mystery of life. And so you learn to trust. Today, 250,000 new people were born on this earth. 
They all count. I have a new niece who was born three days ago. I saw her yesterday. She was her second day. And I said, wow, your second day. Way cool. Welcome, you know. <laughs> it was really great. And this tiny, she was like about that big, you know. But they keep coming in, right? We do. <laughs> and recycling and going out. And so what you do with impermanence is you bow in wonder to the endless creativity of life. Like the grass that pulls, it pushes itself up through the sidewalks. Um, and it's not a mystery that you're separate from. You are life living itself in a cycle. At home, 4 p.m. today, says the female moth, and releases a brief explosion of bombacol hormone, a single molecule of which will tremble the hairs of any male within miles and send him driving upwind in a confusion of ardor and desire. You know how males are. But it is doubtful if he has an awareness of being caught in a spray of chemical attractant. On the contrary, he probably finds suddenly that it has become an excellent day the weather remarkably cool and bracing, the time appropriate for a bit of exercise of the old wings, a brisk turn upwind. And en route, traveling the scent gradient of Bombacol, he notes the presence of other males headed in the same direction, all in a good mood, inclined to race for the sheer sport of it. And then when he reaches his destination, it may seem to him the most extraordinary of coincidence, the greatest piece of luck why, bless my soul, what have we here? <laughs> you know? And we are, we are part of some stream. You are. And to be free is to recognize this and make something beautiful out of it. What in your life is changing that wants to be accepted this day, this week, this month? To live with graciousness. And in sorrow and unsatisfactoriness, just as there's the gift of creativity, endless change, possibility in impermanence, in unsatisfactoriness and sorrow is the capacity to feel and respond. It's the capacity for compassion. As the Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel writes, suffering confers neither privileges nor rights. It all depends how you use it. If you use it to increase the anguish of yourself or others, you are degrading, even betraying it. And yet the day will come when we shall understand that suffering can elevate human beings. God help us to bear our suffering well. And so, um, the measure of sorrows that has been granted to you as to everyone in this life, you are called upon to hold with a compassionate heart for yourself and for everyone else around you. This is the only way we'll survive. As the poet Rilke said, ultimately it's upon our vulnerability that we depend. And we are vulnerable to one another, to life. So I had this conference that I was the moderator of, convener of, with the Dalai Lama and a group of 25 people who'd come from prison projects around the country and gotten out of prison. Um, many of them had been there a really long time, 20 years, 25 years in Oklahoma State and, and, uh, and in Louisiana and Oregon and had done a lot of pretty rough things and hard time both men and women, and Dalai Lama brought a couple of young nuns who'd been in prison and tortured in Tibet to talk about their experience. And these prisoners were just astonished by the nuns because they talked about their torture and being starved. And these guys said, we complained about the food. We had nothing like what happened to you. And these nuns were radiant. But anyway, there was a woman who spoke to the Dalai Lama at one point. We were all kind of telling stories. And she said she'd been thrown, put in prison for she was in prison for 14 years for being an accessory to an armed robbery where someone was killed. She was just in the car outside. Um, but she said after a bunch of years, you just get hard in there. You have to. And then this young woman was moved into her cell, a short timer. And they didn't really want short timers. They would got their routine. And she said, that's your bed. That's where you sleep. That's the deal. And kind of ignored her. She was going to be in there for four months or six months or something. 
But the young woman wouldn't eat and kept throwing up. And she just ignored her and didn't want to pay attention to the short timer. And all of a sudden it dawned on her that she was pregnant. And she asked and sure enough it was true. And it whispered down the cell blocks and pretty soon people were hoarding food and sending it to her. And after a while, this woman who was there for a good part of her pregnancy became the, the center of that whole set of cells in that whole block. How is she doing? Is she eating? How's the baby? Her belly's getting bigger. And they all owned her in some way as aunties, as they should, as the village. Um, and when she got out, she got out a couple months before her baby was delivered, um, she sent a picture back and, you know, and, and this woman said there was a cheer, you know, that lasted for a long, long time in the cell block, like it was also their child. Um, but this woman said the main thing was that I had so hardened my heart to survive what I was going through in there. And this young woman came in who I didn't even want to talk to and didn't put it arms like and wouldn't do anything for. And as soon as we felt the new life in her, she said, it cracked me open. And I realized I couldn't live that way anymore. I couldn't live with a closed, hardened, walled off heart. And it was after that that I changed and I started my yoga and I started meditation and I started to change my life. I looked for what would help me because I knew that just as something new was growing in her, something new needed to grow in me. And so there's redemption. There's a capacity to grow through your suffering. Rachel Remen again says, to know suffering makes us trustworthy. How's that? To know suffering makes us trustworthy. And Ajahn Chah would say, when did you learn the most? When it was easy or hard? You know, what most opened you? The dark night when you faced difficulty? I mean, what in your life is asking to be held in compassion like that woman? What in your life wants to be held with the great heart of compassion that's suffering around you in family, in community, in your own confusion? Because tending this is what will bring you freedom. We turn to the gods for help when our foundations are shaking only to learn that it is the gods who are shaking them. <laughs> right? <coughs> So in impermanence is the gift of creativity, endless, amazing, start anew. In our sorrows is also the gift of compassion. Folks, it's only when we touch our hearts and our struggles that we can love another. And in selflessness and emptiness is the truth of interdependence. Brothers and sisters everywhere, a Taoist master was sitting in his mountain cabin meditating when a group of Confucian scholars who would climbed up the mountain to his hut came to see him and saw him sitting there. They had intended to lecture him or talk with him about the proper rules of conduct and Confucian behavior. But what they saw in front of him was the sage sitting naked. And they were shocked and said, what are you doing sitting in your hut without any pants on? And the sage replied, the entire universe is my hut. This little hut is my pants. <laughs> what are you fellows doing in my pants? <laughs> because when you, when you accept your measure of sorrows, and the suffering of the world and turn not away from it, but allow it to touch your heart. When you accept change, when you actually let life come to you, then it turns out it brings you alive. And you don't say when you burn your hand or you stub your toe, oh, I wonder if I should care about that toe, you know, and bandage it because it's bleeding that toe, you know, as if it was, some, you just, you know, you touch something hot and you pull your hand off of it because it's you. But as you get quiet, as you s sit quietly, and quiet the mind and open the heart and look at this mystery, you see that your brothers and sisters are everyone. 
and that you are woven, as Martin Luther King says, into a single garment of destiny. And then in each meal that you take is a love for the earth and the spice islands and the rainforest and Mahenjadaro in Africa and the first corn plants that the Mayans and the Incans then took up. They're all there in your meal, you know. And in every child is the innocence of every child ever born on this earth. Each child carries that, that you see. And every dog has the ancient campfires in the caves and the deserts that came to sit by our sides. You know that. And when somebody's hungry, you feed them. And they fall and you pick them up. And it shifts to a kind of wonder. Because when you get quiet, you find the way to be both steady in yourself and at the same time gracious. And maybe the only real sorrow, yes, we have our losses and death and suffering and all those things come, but maybe the real sorrow is not to be free enough in your heart to love anyway, to give your particular gifts, to respond as you can, to walk with dignity like Aung San Suu Kyi and Nelson Mandela, to give your gift of art or medicine or business or food or silence or whatever it is, and to shine your Buddha nature, your, your beauty, so that you and the other shine for one another. Live in joy, says the Buddha, in love, even among those who hate. Live in joy and health, even among the afflicted. Live in joy and peace, even among the troubled. Look within, be still, free from fear and confusion and attachment. Know the sweet joy and freedom of the way.